Hello and welcome to this edition of HealthPoint TV. I'm Dr. Michael Wood, Chief Medical Officer at Mills Peninsula Health Services. Today, we're at the new Behavioral Health Center in San Mateo. For more than 35 years, Mills Peninsula has been a leader in community mental health and chemical dependency treatment. With our new facility in San Mateo, we will be able to take care of even more patients and reach out to more people that need help for these various problems. Today, we'll be taking you on a behind the scenes tour and speak to the experts that provide the care through the various programs that are available in this wonderful and spacious new center. Ask any parent of a teenager and they will tell you how difficult it is to understand what's going on in their teen's mind. Today we will meet Dr. Dan Becker who will discuss some of the challenges that teenagers face and the impact of those challenges on a teenager maintaining good mental health. Adolescence is an exciting time of development for teens as well as for their parents. It is uh, both exciting but it's also fraught with many challenges. This is a time of life when teens feel a pressure both socially as well as biologically and psychologically to grow up. And although they have many uh, developing skills cognitively and physically, they also may lack the judgment or experience or the uh, impulse control to make good use of those new skills. For these reasons, we sometimes observe seriously maladaptive behaviors during adolescence, including drug and alcohol abuse. In fact, it's worth noting that the leading cause of death in teens is accidental injury. The second is violence, and the third, sadly, is suicide. In addition, many serious psychiatric disorders find their onset during this period of life. These include drug and alcohol abuse, eating disorders, but also major mood disorders such as depression and psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia. For these reasons and others, it's important that communities have appropriate psychiatric and substance use treatment facilities for adolescents and to help their families. Here on the peninsula, we're very fortunate to have one such facility uh, the Mills Peninsula Health Services has outstanding adolescent treatment programs which have become larger and have become better, frankly, since the opening of our new facility at the Mills Health Center in downtown San Mateo. We have both inpatient and outpatient programs. Here we have a 13-bed inpatient unit, the only such facility on the peninsula. We also have intensive outpatient programs, our after-school programs for adolescents, which uh, run for several hours a day for several days a week. These programs uh, provide intensive programming for families as well as group programming for kids in an effort to uh, keep them in their homes and keep them involved in their routine activities while providing them with, with fairly intensive psychiatric intervention. Uh, these, these programs can serve both to prevent hospitalization in kids who are at risk, but also as a means of transitioning some kids out of the hospital setting when it's time for them to leave the, the inpatient program. Two and a half years ago when we began this project, we met with the design team and with the contractors. We told them that two things were of the utmost importance. Number one, that the facility be safe, and it is. Number two, that the facility afford a sense of openness, lightness, bringing the outdoors in, feeling like being at home. We believe that we've achieved this objective as well. When kids come here for treatment, when parents bring their kids here for help, they can feel apprehensive about the condition uh, that they're experiencing, but also about whether they're gonna achieve the, the results that they're hoping for and receive the help that they, they, they feel they need. We think that this open, light-filled, home-like setting provides an excellent beginning for people to begin their journey toward health. Parents often ask me, how do I know if my kid needs help? 
I think basically there are two ways that we know somebody is uh, suffering from a mental illness or from a drug or alcohol addiction. One way is distress. Some kids will just come right out and they'll tell you, I'm depressed, I feel suicidal. Uh, some kids will tell you, I'm smoking pot. Uh, that's great if, if the kid can come out and tell you directly. Uh, they're expressing their distress. The other way is to look for signs of dysfunction. By analogy, in a grown-up, if people become dysfunctional, they're not going to work, they're not performing up to their usual level at work, they're not taking care of their families, they're not uh, taking care of their social uh, responsibilities. Uh, same is true for kids. Kids have jobs too, they involve uh, activities around the home, but most importantly perhaps it involves school. Kids who are having psychiatric difficulties or kids who are suffering from a drug or alcohol problem will often stop attending school as regularly as they had, uh, or if they are attending school, their school performance will drop off. A kid who is getting Bs, let's say, over the past several years will start uh, bringing home Ds and Fs. These kinds of indicators of dysfunction are, again, a good reason to talk to your kid and, quite likely, a good reason to seek professional help. Addiction to pills has become an epidemic throughout the entire United States. We went through a phase several years ago where doctors were encouraged to treat pain in a much more humane, satisfactory way. That put a lot of Vicodin and Percocet and tranquilizers in people's medicine cabinets. Over time, people feel that they are feeling better when they take the pills and tolerance builds over time. So someone is taking two or three Vicodin a day for a chronic pain condition, before they know it, they're taking five or six and then they're on the slippery slope of getting early refills of prescriptions, either it's tranquilizers, sleeping pills, or prescription opiates such as Vicodin, Narco, Percocet. This is dependence. The people who are using the medications to get high, that's what we call addictive disease. There's a big difference. Dependence means that you have a physical dependence on either the tranquilizer or the opiate. And if you stop them abruptly, you will get sick and go into withdrawal. Addictive disease has physical dependence but it's also associated with a lot of aberrant behavior, such as lying, cheating, manipulating, problems at work, buying on the internet, doctor shopping, going to multiple doctors. Some even go so far as to forge prescriptions or change the numbers on the prescription. So instead of getting 20, they're getting 120. So those are all characteristics of addictive disease rather than just plain physical dependence. There, there's a certain aspect of addictive disease that's called enabling behavior. It's the family members more often than anyone else who can put pressure on the alcoholic or addict to say, this has got to stop. We have a variety of different programs that people can call by just calling the medical center and asking for the intake department. We have all levels of care. We have detoxification, which is the first step of getting off alcohol or drugs. We then have a variety of different phases of rehabilitation services. We have day treatment programs. We have noon outpatient programs. We have evening outpatient programs so that we can accommodate people who have certain job Ob obligations or babysitting or whatever is going on in their life. We are trying to be supportive of people from where they are and what they have to do with their own life experiences and we adapt a unique program for them that will accommodate them for their own life responsibilities. 
One of the most important messages I can give to people is to tell them, number one, it's very easy to quit. Number two, it's almost impossible to stay quit unless you get some specific help. Exercise is just as important to your mental and emotional health as it is to your physical health. It can improve your quality of life, reduce stress, relieve symptoms of depression and anxiety, give you more energy, and even helps you sleep better. Now here's the secret. During exercise, there is a release of endorphins in the body that are capable of producing feelings of euphoria, and all it takes is moderate amounts of exercise to experience the effects. Our first exercise is the push-up. Here's the proper technique. Lie face down on your mat with your hands shoulder width apart. Keeping your back straight and your hands directly under your shoulders, exhale and lift your body off the floor. Keep your feet together and do not bend your knees. Maintain soft elbows at the top of the movement. Now inhale and lower your body till your chest is slightly touching the floor. Then repeat. Do one to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions. In the beginning, you may only be able to do one set of five until you develop strength and stamina for more. And if it's too hard, you can always do them from the knees. The next exercise is the bicycle crunch. Lie on the floor and lace your fingers behind your head and allow your head to drop into your hands. Bring the knees in towards the chest and lift the shoulder blades off the floor without pulling on the neck. Straighten your left leg out while at the same time turning the upper body to the right, taking the left elbow towards the right knee. Switch sides bringing the right elbow towards the left knee. Continue alternating sides in a pedaling motion for one to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions. And one of the best things about exercise is that it makes you feel great and improves your mood. So enjoy your workout. Sugar. It's everywhere. A lot of discussion about it. You talk to any parent that's bringing a child home from a birthday party and they're going to tell you that between all that cake, soda, and cookies, they have a hyperactive child in the back seat. Do scientific studies support that? There hasn't been one convincing one that linked sugar to hyperactivity or actually changing behavior. But do we need sugar in our diet? Well, we're hardwired to like sweets. So eliminating it can be difficult, but reducing it is not impossible. All sugars aren't created equally. We get sugars from our milk and fruits. Did you know that milk has lactose, which is a form of sugar? But just think of all the nutrients you're getting with a glass of milk. Fruits also contain fructose, which is a type of sugar. These are sugars we really don't worry about because they're nutrient dense and they give us a lot of the nutrients our body needs. Well, it's hard to imagine, but the average American consumes between 150 and 170 pounds of sugar a year. You don't think that's you? Just think about it. If we had the three pound pack of sugar that you buy at the grocery store, and line them up on the conveyor belt, 150 pounds might equal something to the effect of 42 of them. How is that possible? Well, not only are we getting a lot of sugar in the foods we choose, but there's a lot of hidden sugar in our package products. That's what we can pay attention to. Do you drink your sugar? If you drink sodas or juices, you're drinking sugars that really don't register that you've eaten food or taken in calories. It's just extra calories to that meal. Isn't it something to think that you're getting 10 teaspoons of sugar in a 12 ounce soda? But probably a little bit more amazing is you're getting an equal amount of sugar in an equal amount of apple juice. 
Artificial sweeteners, are they right for you? How do they work? Well, there are a lot of them on the market and there's a lot of controversy about them. To be conservative, I suggest limiting them to two servings a day. They are so much sweeter than sucrose that it only takes a pinpoint to have the same sweetening power. Therefore, they can use less and calorically add almost no calories and give it the same sweetening power. Being realistic, most people aren't willing to completely eliminate the sugar from their diet, but it is worthy to look for those hidden sources. A product called high fructose corn syrup solids is becoming very prevalent in a lot of our food system. You're gonna hear more and more about high fructose corn syrup solids because we think they actually might be causing a lot of the weight gain in our country and contributing to obesity. You know how you find out if, if a product has high fructose corn syrup solids? It's just scan the ingredient label. The first three things that are listed on the ingredient label are the foods that are in predominance in that product. If you see high fructose corn syrup solids, as a consumer, you can look for another product to find one that doesn't have it. Most people don't think of honey as sugar, but it's actually fructose and has calorically the same amount, teaspoon for teaspoon, as sugar, as well as brown sugar and agave. So you don't want to give up dessert. What's an alternative? Here's one of my favorites. Take some fresh fruit that's in season. For right now, I have a pear. Cut it open, add some of that great Greek yogurt that adds a little touch of tartness, some nuts, and fresh mint, it makes for a very satisfying dessert. But you're not adding all those extra empty calories. Whether you choose to include sugar in your diet or not, it's probably good for most of us to limit the amount that we're eating. We're now on the third floor of the Mills Health Center taking a look at the new Behavioral Health Center. To my left is a consolidation of all of the outpatient programs. There's chemical dependency, seniors, and adult and adolescent mental health. To my right is our inpatient unit. There are 39 beds on this unit, 26 for adults and 13 for adolescents. First room as you come off the elevators here, you'll see a waiting room for family and visitors. Down at the end of the hall here, an improvement of this unit, we now have separate entrances for our adult unit and our adolescent unit. So we'll start on the adolescent unit. On my right here is our occupational therapy room, so we can do cooking, art classes. We also have a DVD player. Taking a look in one of our rooms, you'll see this is a double patient room. We encourage the patients to be social in this unit. Over here we have a shared interview room. This is where families and visitors could be taken for private counseling and to visit with a patient on the unit. Continuing on down the hall, we have some more patient rooms on this side. And you come out to our main nurse station. This is the main nurse station for this adolescent unit. And you'll notice it also has full visual contact with the day room and the dining room. So this is where adolescents are able to sit, watch television programs or movies. They'll also be taking their meals here. One of the best features we were able to take advantage of on this unit is the outdoor courtyards that are here on the third floor. You'll notice that the ceiling enables us to get fresh air into the unit, feel like you're actually outside. The windscreen surrounding this courtyard is made of uh, special safety glass. It should be a very peaceful area. Coming back into the day room, you'll notice this wall behind me is called a wall talker. So we've actually covered it with a whiteboard material. You'll be able to write all over these walls with dry erase markers and very easy to clean. Notice the detail in the ceiling. The goal was to make a nature feeling in here. So we tried to capture the feeling of clouds and bring them into the space. And we have earth tones and greens on the floor to get more of a nature feeling. Entering the adult unit, the first thing you'll notice on this side is the main nurse station where the nurse coordinator will sit. 
This is also the main monitoring station for all of the uh, security cameras on this end of the unit. Over here to my left, you'll see this is the other end of the OT, occupational therapy room for cooking and crafts. This room is shared between the two units and will never be used by the adult or the adolescent group at the same time. Right inside from the front doors is the main dining area for the adult unit and the main seating television area. Also on this unit, like on the adolescent unit, we have an outdoor courtyard. Then outside of this courtyard area, we have all new landscaping. We're walking down to the back of the unit where we'll find a work area. This area will be used for charting and uh, paperwork, anything the staff needs to do here. There's also a treatment planning room on this unit. This will be used by the medical staff for conferences. So one last television coming to go on the wall there. Continuing down this back hallway, there's additional patient rooms. So remember this unit has 26 adult patient rooms. So down this hall to my right is the mental health outpatient program. That's the adult and adolescent outpatient programs that support our inpatient unit. Behind me is the chemical dependency and the senior program. So walking through here, this is the main function area for chemical dependency in the senior program. Another nice feature of this room is there's also an oven and stove in here that can be used for baking programs. Some of the senior programs involve uh, cooking classes. This is the alumni office. With over two years in the making and the patient in mind during all of the design and construction process, we're extremely pleased to open this light and airy facility to the community of San Mateo. To learn more about behavioral health issues and the programs available here at our new facility at Mills Health Center, check our website. Thank you very much for joining us on this week's edition of HealthPoint TV. See you next time.